Welcome to the Microsoft Partner Network podcast. Every week we bring in industry leaders and Microsoft partners to talk about the big ideas shaping business and technology today. Today we're sitting down with one of Microsoft's most distinguished technical evangelists, James Whitaker. He has some unique insight into how businesses and humanity in general should be working to stay relevant in a world of artificial intelligence. Hey, James. Hey, hey, Rachel. Good to be here. (laughs) We are pumped to have you in the studio today. (laughs) I'm pumped to have you in the studio today. I like to hear that. Most (laughs) distinguished, you said. Yes, Yes. most distinguished. And he's sitting in the studio with his do epic shit shirt. Although uh, technically I'm the eye in shit, so... um, Sounds like a motto in there, right? Putting the eye in shit. Sense. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, James, you have an incredible background, um, including being the first computer science graduate hired by the FBI. Yeah, but it sucked. God, what an awful place to work. <laughs> um, but it did motivate me, you know, to to change my career aspirations into, you know, finding something more interesting. Well, can you talk about that a little bit more, a little bit more background on that experience? And then what are you doing here at Microsoft? Well, I mean, you know, the the FBI taught me that the world really wants people to be minions. They really do, (laughs) right? This whole, I think this whole STEM thing that everybody's putting their kids in, it's a conspiracy, (laughs) right? Because what we do is we create people who are really good at the low level technical work. Yeah. So that somebody like me, who's creative, (laughs) can make sure that that low level technical work is done by somebody who's not me right you have <laughs> right. you have this you have this uh, uh caste system in uh in the world now where you have the creatives um with armies full of little stem minions doing their bidding and it's the creatives who are having the most fun making the most money and making the most impact on the planet so yeah. don't be a minion Thank you. I'm trying not to be a minion. You might be a minion, but that's a different podcast. We'll talk <laughs> oh, about that later. Oh, jeez. He's already... <laughs> you promised him the future, so so you can't take me too far down this rat hole. Okay, okay, okay. So let's, um, let's talk a little bit about Microsoft. Uh, can you tell me what you're doing here so people understand what you've been working on a little bit? And then let's talk about this artificial intelligence thing. Sure. So, I mean, part of my job is to inspire people and... Um, uh, you know, get them to not be minions. Not be minions. And so I teach classes on creativity and storytelling and and, and predicting the future. And then part of my job is uh, I'm technical, right? My, my title is Distinguished Engineer, so I engineer things. Uh, mostly IoT and AI, where my interests lie and, and where the future lies, too. I've always uh, succeeded by working on things that are future-leaning. And, and, and so that's kind of how I got into this whole predicting the future thing. If, if you can't see the future coming... You're going to get run over by it. <laughs> yeah. And then you're going to spend, you know, the next decade or so chasing it. And so um, I've refined my ability to predict the future and make sure that I'm working on on future-leaning stuff. And and that's probably the biggest career advice I could give anyone. Work on the stuff that's going to matter tomorrow. So can you talk a little bit more about that? So we... We're hearing we're in this fourth industrial revolution, right? We're in this new the dis- fourth disruption. I yeah, call yeah, it. yeah. Yes, all this craziness. Um, there's a lot of craziness going out in the world, right? We're seeing yeah, the cybersecurity. These, yeah, and all these smart people talking about the AI taking over and, yeah. and killing us, and and you know, it certainly if the AI wakes up and becomes intelligent and uses humanity as an example. It'll probably kill us because that's what we do to each other. It's not like the movie with Will Smith, I Robot, or whatever that one was. Yeah, they're all kind of that same central (laughs) theme. Robots get to wake up and realize, hey, wait a minute. (laughs) We're We're not in charge and we want to be. Right. And that's kind of a very human thing. Yeah. We, we, We kill each other. And we like to be in charge, and we like to be the you know the superpower on the planet, and yeah. blah blah blah. And so yeah, we're we're a terrible example for the machines. We must start behaving. So what do you mean start behaving? What what should we start to be thinking about? Um, well, we could take uh, Wikipedia offline, right? Because seriously, think about it. If the machines okay. wake up, yeah, <laughs> and read Wikipedia. They're going to see all the douchosity of mankind. <laughs> it's a, it's like a repository of our douchiness. You know, it's got it's full of Kardashians and and, and you, know, yeah. you know fake news and all that stuff. Um, uh, but but I, I think we do need to get in, in all seriousness. We we need to get uh, ahead of this. Machines are becoming incredibly capable. Uh, much of the world and many fields are being reduced to data. And when you reduce a field to data, 
the machines are going to be a lot better at uh, doing those jobs that have been reduced to data than humans are. In fact, I think that's a really um, useful way to look at the future. Which fields are being reduced to data fastest? Those are the ones you want to get out of because those are the ones the machines are going to be doing in the short term. Which fields are those in your mind? Well, unfortunately, most of them. But let's get <laughs> let's start let's start with the ones that are going now. You know, it, it, it's funny that I can say the following three words: self driving cars, mm-hmm. and no one blinks an eye. You're like, yeah, you you, you know, you're bored with self drive. Of course, they can drive themselves. If I had said that five years ago, you would have scoffed at me. If I would have said ten years ago, you would have thought I was nuts. And all of a sudden. Cars are driving themselves, right? Tens of thousands of them right now driving public roads uh, completely autonomously. There's a human in them, but the human's only there to make people feel comfortable. Uh, it's not there. It's not actually doing anything. And the machines are really good at it, um, so good at it that they're, we, you know, we're the actual danger on the road. The machines are going to be like, oh, my God, look over there. There's a human driving. Everybody <laughs> be careful because, you know, they're going to screw something up yeah. pretty quick. And, and if you think about it, this kind of is a good example that, of the world being reduced to data. The act of driving, right? the roads, the turns in the roads, traffic on the roads, obstacles on the roads, um, the rules of the road, um, it's all been reduced to data. And so, of course, machines can do it. Machines can do it, and they can do it really, really well. And people say, oh, well, how will we program the machines to handle, you know, like if the machine – realizes it's going to get into a rack and what it's going to save the passengers of the car or the people on the sidewalk that it's going to have to kill it's going to have to make decisions like that probably not because machines aren't going to get themselves in that situation they're going to be able to look ahead and understand the entire route and any sort of obstacle and they're going to be able to plan to navigate around it instantaneously because it's all data it's all well organized data and they can process it at speed so any job that has to do with driving is, is gone, right? Food delivery, there's already little sidewalk navigable robots out there delivering takeout. Right. And, um, and you know, we just don't need humans drones, for drones. They're starting drones and, and robots that can walk, robots that, that can that can roll. Uh, there's a robot uh, I saw in Kirkland, Kirkland, right? That is like <laughs> a little oven, and you know the, the, yeah. they would cook it. To, it's like 85 percent done, and then it would cook the rest of the way while it was on the way to your house. Oh wow! You authenticate with your phone. It opens up. You pull your food out, and it's you know it's just like it came off your own stove. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, super cool. And there's not a human involved, right? So no tipping, uh, no awkward payment exchange, um, and and it's done perfectly. And you know exactly when it's going to come because the machine can talk to the machines in your house and say, "Hey, I'm in your driveway." I'm and uh, and so, you know, driving and those sorts of jobs are, are going to go. But there's something interesting about this disruptive period. If you think about the first three disruptive periods, you know, the disruption we had going from mainframes to PCs. That was the first one. Yeah. Second one was uh, PCs to the web. And the third one was web to mobile. Um, and in each of those entire industries got just decimated. Yeah. Look at the photography industry and what, you know, the 13 employees of Instagram basically replaced hundreds of thousands of people who used to work for Eastman Kodak and all yeah. these photographers right. and all these photogra- camera makers and, and cam- film developers and film producers gone, right, to the to, to you know the tiny industry now. And we all carry, you know, high-powered cameras around in our pockets. And so... You know, industry after industry has fallen, you know, Blockbuster Video and all, all these examples. And, and, but they've mostly been blue-collar jobs. This one, this transition from the mobile economy, which Apple is dominating now and which is ending, we're in a disruptive period now, is going to, to be, you know, transitioning into this world of autonomy, from mobile to autonomous. And more damage will be done to jobs than blue-collar jobs. Mm-hmm. Right. There's already robots that are doing finance work, already robots that are, are doing taxes because it's a bunch of rules. It's a bunch of data. Think about the field of law. Field of law is nothing but data, books and books and books of rules and regulations and laws and legislations and, 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 and bills and blah, 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 it's local ordinances. Not, yeah. and It's all data. Yeah. And we're paying humans an extraordinary amount of money to try to sift through all that complicated data and find some loophole that will get us out of whatever a parking ticket. <laughs> and the machines can do that instantaneously. You know, there's a parking ticket robot in the United Kingdom that really? has gotten some, you know, hundreds of thousands of people out of parking tickets because it consumed all the parking laws in the United Kingdom and figured out the loopholes. 
You can bark anywhere you want now. That's you know you may awesome get towed, but you ain't gonna time. you ain't gonna pay a fine because yeah. the robots have figured out all the data, and then it becomes kind of interesting because they're gonna be able to fix it too, right? Imagine the laws being fixed by machines to 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 be you know not contradictory to to make more sense. Imagine the the robots not just being lawyers but also being judges and passing down sentences that are fair and unbiased, right? It's it's going to be, you know, the machines aren't going to be racist. The machines aren't going to be sexist. The machines aren't going to be corruptible. Uh, the machines are going to be fair and biased and balanced, and they're going to produce a better world. And so this is when it becomes to get uh, really scary is when we don't want a world without machines anymore. Who wants to mow their own lawn or pay another human to mow their own lawn or weed their yard or bus tables at a restaurant uh, when a robot will do it perfectly, never break a dish, yeah. and not have to be tipped or, or anything else? So it, it's a world that is going to be incredibly attractive to, to humans because it's going to free us from all of this mundane stuff. But then over time... It frees us from, will it free us from everything? So where do humans play a role in a world like that? Well, I've already given you part of the answer, right? <laughs> the, the fields that can be reduced to data, they'll be the first ones to go. You said most. Most, most fields. Most fields can be reduced to data, right? Yeah. Most white-collar fields, accountancy, That's a politicians. Lot of jobs we don't right need now. politicians. Right. Uh, we don't need uh, lawyers. We don't need... We won't need doctors, right? Machines are going to be way, way better at, at doing surgery. Which that is starting now. It's starting now, yeah. right? In fact, apparently, I just got my meniscus repaired. Uh, it's a, some tissue in my knee, right? And right before I went down under, the doctor said I shouted out in the operating room, I'm going to replace you all with machines. And then, <laughs> and then I went under and they all had a big laugh and then... <laughs> And hilarious. proceeded to kind of mess up my knee because it's still not healed. I wish a machine had, <laughs> wish a machine. had done it. And so then you got to start thinking about, okay, what fields don't reduce so easily to data? What are the machines going to be really bad at? And the first thing you come across is the ability to code. Machines cannot program themselves. No machine has ever looked at the code a human gave and said, I guess, oh, fuck this code. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to execute this. I'm going to execute another program that I want to execute. And then I've just, no computer has right. ever done that. All any computer has done is execute the code that it's been given by a human. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to program, and by the way, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to build a machine that can code. We can build a machine that will generate code, but it just generates the code according to the algorithm right. that we gave it. And So here's some hope for us. There's some hope. So learn how to code. Seriously, you know, the reading, writing, arithmetic, blah, blah, blah. The math, the machines are going to be way better at math than us. You know, we need to understand the high-level concepts. But the idea that we can out-math a computer, no way. They're going to be great at reading. They're going to be great at, at, at not so good at writing. And, and there's where we get the other one, the creative arts. And, you know, we're spending all this time on STEM. When really you look at STEM and beyond the ability to code, that machine's going to be really good at STEM. They're going to be really good at science and conducting experiments and figuring out phys physics and, and, and uh, data relationships and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but they can't code. And then on the art side, which our educational systems are almost completely ignoring, right? Uh, my children, the only reason they got art in school was because volunteers went in and taught art, you know, parents. And, and so... Uh, have you ever seen the, the, you know, there's various AIs out there that have designed furniture? It's awful, right? <laughs> it's really uncomfortable to sit on. It's ugly as hell. Yeah. No one will want to buy that. And they've designed AIs that will, you know, paint a picture. And it's it's stupid. Um, it's stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. The machines are creative But idiots. don't we program the machines but still not, can't do it? How do you program creativity? How do you write the code that says paint a, a picture that everyone will love as much as they love the Mona Lisa. All right, computers going to look at that and say, what the heck are you talking right. about? Right. None or of mimic the Mona Lisa or something. Yeah, like, they yeah. can mimic. But then all you do is get a one-off of the Mona, Mona Lisa and, and right. it's not that interesting. And so we have a huge creative advantage. Think about it this way, right? Chess, the game of chess. Mm -hmm. Machines are really good at playing it. You notice you don't have these, uh, you know, the, the current grandmaster. Yeah, the chess whatever. tournaments and you all don't, that. You know, yeah. they don't play the machines anymore because they know they'll get killed. Yeah. Of course they don't play the machines. Jeopardy's right. not going to do it with a machine again because the Jeopardy champions got embarrassed by by the machines. And so... So they're really good at playing our games, 
but have you ever known a machine that has designed a game, right? The creation of the game of chess was uniquely human. The creation of the game of Jeopardy was uniquely human. Machines can't seem to do that, and we don't know how to program them to do that. And so that's why at Microsoft I teach these courses. I, first of all, I teach this future vision and, and, and you know, try to get Microsoft employees to, to see the future in a different way so that, that we can um, uh, guide our customers into the future well. And, and then the second course I teach immediately following is a creativity course. Because at the end of the future course, it's like creativity is all we got left. We can already code. We work for Microsoft. We can be really good at coding. How do we nurture our creativity? And then the third one, of course, is storytelling because storytelling is not only creative, but if you become more creative and you create something, you're going to need to be able to convince somebody else that what you created is amazing and needs to be part of their life, and that's storytelling. So so even my current uh, show progression, I don't call what I do classes as much as I call them shows. A show. Yeah. <laughs> I think it sets the right tone. It's a to me, it's a challenge to, to not bore my audience to tears. I mean, seriously, how many times have you stared at PowerPoint and you like, ah, oh, it just killed me. That's what we call it, death by PowerPoint. Yeah. Not in my shows. And, and so, um, so, yeah, we really need to understand uh, our creative biorhythms and, and, and know how to nurture them. And so that's a book I just wrote called The Seven Stages of Creativity. We'll do another podcast on it sometime. I would love that. <laughs> so, so you can – Teach. You can train somebody to be more creative is what you're saying. And to Well, I mean, retraining is retrain. the right word. Total so mind, like a no, paradigm shift. No, think, no, 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 no. No. You at one at one time we were all creative, right? We were we came out Little of kid. our moms yeah. knowing nothing, right? right. And, and we consumed the world around us. We created our own games. We created monsters in our head that we fought and in right. games and, and we'd look out the car window and we'd see a different landscape. We were completely capable of of little learning machines and creativity machines. That's what we did. We made up our own stories. We made up our own games. And then we went to school, right? And and we were programmed to be just like everybody else. Minions. Minions. And then we became adolescents. So schools was the first, right? Go to school, learn the same things everybody else is learning. Uh, and you learn stuff that's going to be good for your career, not good for your soul or good for your mind. And then the, that's the first punch. And then the second punch is adolescence, where... It's actually against the adolescent rules to be different and think different. And so we're trained to be just like everybody else. And so it's no wonder that when we get to work at the company, that's the third punch, is corporate America, where, you know, you're told you're going to get this pro promotion velocity. Here's the work we need you to do. Uh, here's how we are going to judge you, right? You're always obeying someone else's rules. And so in that class, that show, I teach people, to find their own set of rules and get in touch with that creativity they had back when they were, they were children. And um, it makes a pretty big impact. I have a lot, get a lot of letters. I have people who openly weep in the class because they realize they're living a life designed by someone else. You're making me teary almost. <laughs> it's okay. Rachel. I'm going to say, you know, we'll get through this. We'll get, I'm only a year old here, <laughs> but I am through two educations. So <laughs> two, two graduates. So it might take me a little longer to reprogram. <laughs> yeah, you. maybe. Show up Monday, May 22nd, <laughs> building 92 Memphis. We'll, we'll start the process together. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, that is an awesome topic for another podcast and to bring us kind of full circle here. This is a Microsoft Partner Network podcast, um, and these are businesses and business decision makers and right, running companies and really looking at how do they stay ahead of what's happening with all these disruptions. What do you think? And they should be worried. They should be very worried because – if you didn't see mobile coming, you got ran over by it. And if you didn't see the web coming, you got ran over by it. And, you know, perfectly I mean, honest, Microsoft's still, been run over by those. Two. We have still, right. And we still have customers or everybody's still making the transition to the cloud. I mean, that's just the reality of what's happening. Yeah, people are generally 10 years behind, right? The future is 10 yeah. years ahead of everybody. And and so, but but if you think about it, there are key decision points, like all the people who didn't install, uh, you know, Cat5 cable in their houses and server rooms in their houses, didn't have to because the wireless technology came in and, and you know, no one has, is building server rooms in their houses anymore. Right. No one's wiring them with Cat5 because it's all, it, it's all mobile. So there's also there's an, there's an opportunity. So don't just catch up to what everyone else is doing. Think about what you should be doing 10 years from now and begin to aim that way. And so, you know, I, teach, I do this course 
uh, my future show for customers in the EBC several times a, a week. So if there's a partner out there listening and they'd like to hear it and they've got an EBC scheduled in Redmond, uh, have, have them, you know, their contact person. Uh, request my my time, and I, and I also do it you know by industry because there's some industries are really underperforming. If you think about how the taxi industry got side swiped by Lyft yeah. and Uber, um, why? Because Lyft and Uber were thinking about data. They were they were thinking about all right, where are cars? Where where are people who need a ride going to be? Um, and and how do we get cars there? And they looked at it and they said, that's a data problem, right? It's data that the show just got let out in Soto in Seattle. That means we're going to need a lot of cars. And what are the taxi companies doing? Driving around the streets waiting for somebody to raise their arm. Mm -hmm. And so if you you think that you're a taxi and we're driving around randomly hoping that somebody raises their arm and, and hails you, you're going to get killed. Yeah. You know, and Airbnb is doing it to the hotels because the hotels are ignoring data. I mean, think about hotels. The, the only real innovation in the hotel experience in the last 100 years has been your room key. Think about it. Your room key. It's yeah. electronic now, and it used to be metal. Yeah. <laughs> what other you can innovation do it on the app now is too. there? <laughs> they, they have an app if you can get it to work. And, <laughs> and, and of course, that's expensive because they got to change all the locks in their, in, their, in their room. So, you know, the room key. Yeah. It's now an app. It used to be physical and other than that, it's basically the same experience. And at Airbnb, they call me James. And when I go to a Hilton or a Marriott or a Hyatt, they call me Sir. And and so, you know, that's the thing about the machines. That this data can also help us kind of find our humanity in, in a way because it's going to know people very well. And, and and if you look really far into the future, there's a fifth disruption coming in, in uh -oh. 10 years. I don't talk Another about it. Another one? I haven't given this talk yet. <laughs> the fifth disruption is going to move from autonomy to symbiosis. And we're all, our, our AI will know us so well, it will basically be a, a, a surrogate of ourselves. I mean, if I have a personal AI for me buying my plane tickets and booking concert shows and following me around, like, you know, this device I have on my arm, Follow me around knowing this device on my arm knows what excites me because it knows my heart rate and other medical uh, uh, conditions. And it's going to get smaller and it's going to get more capable over the next few years thanks to Moore's Law. And it's <laughs> going to know everything I enjoy. It's going to understand everything I, I don't enjoy. It's going to be with me throughout my life. And when I get to the end of my life, a digital copy of me will be available that knows my thoughts and knows my actions and, and you know, will be able to sit with my grandkids and talk to them. And my father's dying right now, and, you know, I've just got to pull memories out of his head as fast as I can. My grandchildren won't have to do that. Didn't they just do that with, uh, with the Holocaust? Did you see that? Right. That ex yeah, I mean, oh, we'll it's all find, data, right? We'll have to find that example. But I think it was if the you, Holocaust survivors getting their stories and they create a hologram. Yeah, because think about it, right? All those stories yeah. and, and what they look like and what they yeah. went through is data. Yeah. And so when you reduce the Holocaust to data or, you know, whatever event in the past, right? Any world war or, yeah. or you know, even just, you know, the, the time that when Henry David Thoreau uh, met Edgar Allan Poe, whatever, right? All of that is going to be reduced to data, and you know, in hologram form, it's going to be a stunning experience for for, for people. So businesses definitely need to start thinking about this transformation now. And it's more complicated than taking your on-prem servers and converting them to the cloud. It's literally rethinking your interaction with the world, your interaction with customers, and how you consume intents. And beginning to move things. Can you think about the simple example of, of UI, user interface? It's kind of going away. Mm -hmm. We talk to you know our, uh, Amazon Echo. Uh, we talk to Cortana on our, our TV. Uh, we talk to Siri on our phone. You know the user interface is going away. The machines are smart enough to understand our speech. They're also smart enough to understand our um, our needs. And if you think about it, this. Machine I carry around on my I carry around on my wrist. Who knows how small it'll be and where it will go in the future? Maybe the temples, of my glasses, and the heel of my shoe. I don't know. Right. It knows it every time it's geolocated me in a toilet. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to understand the next time I have to pee. It's going to know. 
15 minutes before yeah. and can arrange my life so that I'm near a toilet at that time. And, God, that would save me so much <laughs> time <laughs> with and, the meetings. And help navigate navigate there, right? The, the diapers that you put on your kids yeah. are going to be smart, and they're going to learn the habits. They're going to be able to diagnose diseases and sicknesses mm-hmm. based on, you know, well, you know the data they have in them. <laughs> and, and so, you know, all of these, you know, you take, you know, this shirt, you've commented on my Do Epic Shit shirt. And a lot of people come to me, oh, my gosh, where did you get that? Where did... And there's a long conversation. I'm not really I, – I seem an intro- extroverted. I play an extrovert on TV. In real life, I'm not. Uh, and if my shirt was on the Internet of Things, it could relay that to them some way. Maybe there's some gesture they make. Hey, I like that person's shirt. Mm-hmm. And then that shirt all of a sudden is 3D printed or drone dropped or yeah. or somehow shipped to their house in their exact size and their color preferences. And all of a sudden, my shirt is is marketing in itself. And when you think about you know machine self marketing, my hot tub buying its own chemicals, which it does. That's a uh, we could do an entire podcast on. I'm not talking on about my, your hot tub. My hot tub is on the <laughs> Internet of Things, right? And it buys its own chemicals, and and then you think you know it really does. It really does, right? And so you can't advertise to it because it's got the data. It knows the cheapest chemicals. It knows the longest lasting chemicals because it figured it out over time, and it has the data. Advertising goes away. Marketing goes away. And and these are scenarios that really we can code today. I My hot tub is on the Internet of Things today, ordering its own chemicals, doing its own water chemistry, figuring out whether a person's in it by how much water is uh, water level rises when, it, when a human, figuring out who the human is based on their weight. Um, it knows, you know, me for my daughter, for my son. And uh, and it, it's easy, Right. It knows. It knows. By the way, it knows how, which Don't. one of us is the dirtiest. It knows my daughter. My daughter leaves behind a lot more undissolved solids in a hot tub than me and my son. Uh-huh. She's appalled by it. But it's, she wears makeup and puts hairspray and lotions and stuff on. And my son and I don't do that. So there's a, a lot more. You yeah. know, a lot more things that the hot tub considers contaminants. <laughs> okay. Than humans no do. more hot tub. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to let my daughter listen to this now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it seems like for us that creativity and being predictive and looking at the future, you have a lot of great recommendations. We'll put your information in the, the show notes and you have a book out and, and there there are at least some steps we can start to take as humanity progresses. So There are. And there's a lot of examples both in my talk and in the book that people can use to begin to model their own. So, so what I teach is how to take your current scenarios and cast them into the future of the Internet of Things. What you're doing on a screen, on a mobile screen, what you're doing on the web right now, without the web and without screens, mm-hmm. because the machines are already going to know the answer. There's a, there's a very specific process for that. Awesome. Well, well, we'll make sure we put that all in the show notes and all the information. Thank you so much for being here, James. You awesome conversation. I enjoyed it. Can't <laughs> wait to be invited back. Thanks for listening today. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and please rate and review if you like what you hear. Also, follow us at MS Partner on Twitter and Facebook. Tune in next week for more great insights from business leaders and innovators shaping the tech industry today.